What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Block Hash Podcast, episode 386. Today, I have Anastasia, the CEO of Fidium, on the show today to talk about the intersection of TradFi and DeFi, as well as the future of institutional crypto infrastructure and what they're doing through Fidium. So, Anastasia, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you on today, and there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, how are you doing? How's your week been? Uh, well, I'm doing very well. I think everyone in crypto is busy, busy nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And congrats, you had 385 amazing episodes. So well oh, done. Thank you. Thank you. And we're still going. We're going for a thousand. That'll take a while, but <laughs> we'll get there. Exactly. But that really, congrats. You know, consistency um, is the key. So um, I'm a big fan. 100%. I always appreciate a fan. Before we start talking about Fidium and getting into some of the, the lines of questions I think we want to discuss today in the topics, tell me a bit about yourself for people in the audience that are curious about uh, who you are, what you've done in the past. What's, what's your background? What's your story? Uh, well, funny enough, my journey started in the um, uh, European Union law enforcement agencies in The Hague. Mm. So uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, fellow lawyers. Yes, hello. And those who don't like us. <laughs> and But that gave me a really great perspective on the regulatory systems and how things work. Um, then I pivoted to the private sector where I spearheaded implementation of blockchain and machine learning for one of the Canadian publicly traded companies. And that product was actually very cool. It's a traceability of efficacy of uh, medical cannabis on the blockchain and analyzing those uh, the results. And uh, that is still being used in Canada by veterans. So this is a, an amazing project that showed me what tech can do on the very practical level, not abstract, but very, very practical. Um, the pivotal moment for me in realizing the full potential of what this whole blockchain can do is when I joined a team of Aave, back then it was still Eastland, and you know, now it's the biggest decentralized lending protocol. And that really immersed me in the blockchain potential and the scope and volume and transactions and how things can scale. And now with Fidium, I'm merging my regulatory knowledge with just passion for tech and for this industry. Awesome. It sounds like you've had an exciting experience getting into uh, the financial aspect of Web3 and, and being a part of it for a while now. Um, so what led to Fidium exactly? Did you co-found that and help start it up? Uh, when did you guys do that? And what's kind of the overall goal and mission? I knew Kelch and Darren, my co-founder, uh, and I'm a CEO and co-founder of Fidium as well, for quite some time. One, um, We started Fidium. Back then, it wasn't even called Fidium. It was called Ape, and it was a non-custodial wallet that Kelch started as a side project. And that thing in 2017, it, it had a top-up feature with cards and gift cards, and it was something truly amazing. And we launched it as a side thing because we were interested and we were not very happy with the, with the wallets that were on the market uh, during that period of time. And then we grew. Uh, we had a community-led investment that allowed us to really work on the platform, launch custody and banking. And then we started to face problems that so many Web3 companies face. We were so unbankable, having all compliance in place and ML, but simply dealing with digital assets or crypto, we were personas non gratis at any banking institution. Then, was, then finally, we got our banking accounts and we started to fully operate because, again, distributed workforce, you have to have, and to pay taxes, you need to have proper fiat rails. We saw... I wouldn't say discrimination, but we were not welcomed as an industry, you know, and maybe sometimes for good reason, but we were not wanted. And then we figured that out and we started just helping other companies, smaller companies that are just starting in this in the space to to set things properly, especially when it comes to exchanges of crypto to fiat, fiat to crypto, sub accounts, etc. And those companies are facing exactly the same problems we were facing two years ago. You can't run your business if you are not properly set up. And then, of course, we had Mika uh, markets for uh, crypto in Europe regulation. Then finally, European Parliament voted and said, yes, now, thankfully, on this side of the world, we have very clear rules what companies can do and cannot do, including financial institutions. So every day, operationally, it's, being, it's becoming easier and easier to work. 
Very nice. Yeah, the landscape today is much different than it has been in the past. I've been in crypto and Web3 for uh, well over 10 years at this point in different levels of uh, professionality, but it, I've got a chance to watch it grow and see some of the, the hurdles get through. And obviously we're at a different point today and it's amazing how far it's come. You got ETFs now and they're being traded in the futures market and um, you see trust being formed. Like there's so many institutional products starting to be formed and it's very exciting time from the financial side and then starting to see, you know, actual use cases getting applied. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool, but it's been a rough ride in the past, like, uh, especially <laughs> the last couple of years. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it has been a rough ride and, you know, I think with every wave of adoption, uh, we see vulnerabilities as well as strengths. So strengths-wise, you see new amazing companies launching protocols, developing truly amazing real-world cases. And then you see a lot of scandals. And unfortunately, crypto is not only democratizing finance in traditional sense, it took some, some of the sense of traditional financial industry. So I don't think it's our industry that's the worst. It just, it, it is what it is. But now we see... I think you, you're 100% correct. And being 10 years in crypto um, uh, as you've been, you saw it all from super inconvenient interfaces to ETFs and how even consumer behavior changes and probably how your behavior changed it, how you interacted with assets as well. 100%. And it's still evolving. That's the crazy thing about this space. Like who knows where it's going? Um, but it's very exciting at the same time. You never get bored. But um, one of the key aspects, I think, has been finding ways to really bridge, you know, the traditional financial side with the decentralized financial side, DeFi, within Web3, within blockchain, and, you know, what people are building within this industry and finding ways to connect the two and, you know, kind of fill in those, those empty gaps, I think, that hold people back from being able to use both at the same time or interact both at the same time. Um, so I'm curious, you know, at Fidium, like what kind of strategies do you guys look to implement in terms of helping bridge that gap between TradFi and DeFi? I think when, when we started just structuring our products and approaching institutions when it comes to their needs, we realized that their needs are very much different from our, I would say, very vast crypto community. They are, some of them are interested in speculation, but most often it's buy and hold with some very, very conservative actions, what they do. So they, interestingly enough, they're not interested in social aspects of decentralization. It's not the end goal for them. It's a method. And with that, knowing that, we, we can really see very clearly, even though if we take decentralized finance, collateralized loans, that instrument existed for the longest period of time. We just put it on the blockchain and made it more accessible to, to really vast number of individuals. So institutions, and we see it very clearly, if they see the blockchain is an appropriate technology for whatever use case it is, they're very much interested because it has so many amazing properties such as immutability and traceability and almost instant settlements. So when it comes to things like settlements and cross-border transactions, institutions are very interested, as well as just infrastructure, because they, they do have a demand from their clientele in interacting with, with digital assets, even outside ETFs. I also know that institutions are slowly starting to experiment and invest and acquire assets across the crypto industry. Uh, they better label it digital assets. They talk about it all the time. They talk about tokenization, they talk about NFTs, they talk about assets on chain. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how you guys help build trust with these institutions around this industry, because obviously there's risk implied in crypto and in DeFi and in different aspects of Web3 as much as there is opportunity. So um, what are some things Fidium does to help build and maintain that level of trust for institutions so that they feel more safe and secure? with Web3. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, even Fidium, uh, the word itself, it's a variation from Latin, fide, which means trust. The, the core thing, and you said something very interesting. Uh, initially, we were calling all of this crypto. Then it became digital assets mm -hmm. because we wanted to sound more legitimate, I think, all of us. 
But now even the European regulation is called marketing crypto assets, assets based on principles of cryptography. So we're back to crypto, but now crypto is not a bad word anymore. And this is this is what industry already achieved as a whole in, in really bringing more trust, showing that we're mature enough, not only to follow existing regulations, but also to actively work with the regulators and stakeholders, etc. On our side, we do and try to do just that. Um, DeFi in particular, it can be very volatile, especially when it comes to custody. For us, it might seem fairly easy, even though I'm pretty sure all of us lost money at some point because of the misplaced mm -hmm. wallet keys or some phishing attack. It's a, it's a very common thing. Institutions, they do not have this margin of error. They, they can't. It's um, um, even though there, there were some scandals with, uh, with them, but it's um, we allow them to reduce that risk. And it comes with uh, different tools such as protocols for signatures. Uh, the, um, just the protection and segregation of institutions' assets and their clients' assets. So things like, for instance, that happened at Celsius will happen, as an example. It's um, essentially the same prudent rules that, uh, that are implemented in current banks as well as hedge funds need to be implemented here. And having things on chain, it makes it more challenging, but the best practices are already there. You don't have to invent a lot. You just need to provide technological equipment for those institutions to use that. When we come and we speak with CFO and product owners at the respective institutions, they are not very interested in how exactly the smart code is working. It's not their core business. They want to know that it works and they have options and the funds can be retrieved one way or another. And this is why we see also shift from DeFi to hi-fi, what we call hybrid finance. Because the ability, it's, um, DeFi is fantastic and I support it wholeheartedly as an idea and principles, but there are so many risks that most institutions are still being very, very conservative. So hybrid uh, access where you through different methods of wallets and logins can segregate those assets and then interact with a very limited area of DeFi they like that more than complete Wild West. They're not going to ape into different LPs and chase those high APYs. See, I learned something new today, Hi-Fi. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, is that something that you guys came up with or is that something that's starting to come up with when you guys work with institutions, like the word they like to use for types of use cases? We haven't, we haven't trademarked this word, but this is what we started to use, explaining, first of all, to our clients what it is. Okay. It's not a DeFi, it's not a CeFi, it's a hybrid model. Of course, some clients, they like pure CeFi and it's very, very straightforward. But in a sense, if they wanted to be more adventurous, HiFi mm -hmm. is the way to go because within their mandates, they can't, they just can't be, they're a traditional crypto user, let's say, in the Web3 space. They, they, they have their limitations. And I saw some other wonderful companies also using hi-fi term. Because what we very often forget being, you know, this full-time in crypto is when we, when normal people pay something with cards or their card is being stolen, they can call their bank and block it. And same happens with uh, one larger instances. The larger the clients, the, the higher the risk or the higher the mm -hmm. problems that might arise. So they need those safeguards. So this is hence HiFi. Yeah, it makes sense. Like there's things I love about DeFi, but at the same time, I can't live a life with just DeFi. Like traditional finance has a pretty strong mainstay. Like how am I gonna pay my bills or pay an employee or pay for expenses for my podcast or my company? Um, you know, how am I gonna go buy a coffee? Like it's it's not like I can just walk out with Bitcoin and pay with whatever I want or use other um, cryptos within the industry through DeFi or, you know, these things don't link together as well as they need to yet. So HiFi makes a lot of sense, you know, finding some kind of intermediate where you can, again, like you said, be adventurous, um, especially if you're an institution, but, you know, you also have some security at the same time. Exactly. And your example is the best uh, running a business. And that, that applies both to small to medium enterprises to large ones. There are some protocols and standards. In some countries, you can pay taxes in crypto. Fantastic. But it's not scalable. And when you're scaling business, you want as less friction as possible. 
Exactly. That, that's the biggest thing. Like, like I live in Colombia right now and mm -hmm. I'm from the U S so even moving money back and forth is a huge frictionful headache. <laughs> um, yeah. and even in crypto, like if I want to do it, um, like there's no more for me to really go to, to cash it out or to still use it here in Colombia. So there's a lot of friction in the industry and that's, that's definitely a thing that causes so many bottlenecks. Do you think CBDCs are going to solve this at least partially? I'm honestly not a fan of CBDCs, and I think I voice it quite often, but I do think in theory a CBDC would be a good solution. The, the, the problem is it's the same thing as a digital asset or a cryptocurrency or um, however you want to relate it to within Web3. The difference is it's not fully decentralized. It's controlled by a governing body, and that leads to a lot of concerns, obvious concerns, um, that I think most people are a little too shy to experience like in some countries it's just kind of implemented and, and that's that um like the the e naira or the japanese yuan uh and their cbdc that they have like some countries you don't you don't get much of a say but in the us you know that's a big question mark and while it would solve certain friction problems um is it worth trading that for potentially full control over your money or full control over what you could spend it on or monetary surveillance. Like there's a lot of things that, you know, get raised in terms of questions. Um, so that's why I'm not all for it. I do think crypto can still solve those problems in and of itself. It's just a matter of convincing government to give us proper regulations for it. Yeah, exactly. It's um, CBDCs. It's a uh, very interesting topic because on a very practical level, let's say here in the European Union, we have uh, in the Eurozone, uh, all transactions, most of them are instant, what we call SEPA instant. Uh, everything is recorded. Of course, governments, they know and see what you're doing. And we accepted it. So CBDC is like de facto, nothing would change. You know, practically you're using through the wallet and you, you don't see any difference. But when it comes to cross-border jurisdictions going, stepping outside, the, the, the given jurisdiction where you're operating and then we add on that privacy concerns and human rights concerns but then it's becoming a very very difficult difficult topic because as you said it will be convenience or your privacy exactly so what we'll see in the the near future you know can cbdc's maybe be modified or be made a little bit more open source or is there a way to do it potentially or can they just take something like bitcoin or another really good remittance uh, payment network like like uh, Ripple and XRP or Stellar Lumens and XLM. There's a bunch of them out there. They're really, really mm -hmm. good. It's just a matter of getting governments to say, go ahead, play with it, do what you want, and then getting institutions lined up to actually feel comfortable trying it. Um, and then businesses to accept it. So it's more of an ecosystem issue, in, in my opinion. Like, I think we wouldn't have to talk about CBDCs if we could go out and I could buy coffee with Bitcoin right now. It's just that the bank in Colombia is not going to accept it. So the business won't accept it. So yes. things need to change within the market, uh, in the retail market, at least for transactional spending of crypto. In terms of, um, you know, regulations, kind of going back to that with institutions, I'm sure that's something you also kind of work with them on to help kind of guide them through potential compliance and what they need to know. Um, I'm curious like what that looks like for you guys, especially again, over the last couple of years, regulation has been a huge headline um, across Web3 and has been something that has actually kind of hindered it in many ways and has left a lot of people unsure if they should even touch the industry, um, you know, because we don't know if something is a security or if it's property or if it's a currency or if you can hold it or how it's getting taxed or um, where it came from. Did it come from a criminal organization or a terrorist? Like, you know, are you liable if you're spending that? Like, how do you know? So there's so many different problems, uh, kind of problems in terms of regulation around crypto. How do you guys go about navigate, navigating it for institutions? Here we are facing, in a sense, very, I would say not ethical dilemma, but just very deep ethical question. Uh, all the points you mentioned, they're absolutely correct. And then you see difference in certain countries. Let's say I'm from Eastern European country. 
post-Soviet country. My parents, when they hear cryptocurrency, um, you know, especially in the earlier terms, not controlled by government, non-licensed, for them it made sense because, because they saw everything being taken and governments collapse and your paper money worthless. For them and for us, I think here, and especially in some of the Latin American countries, that concept just made sense. Some other countries that had more luck historically for them, which was like, oh, taxes and this and that. Well, our regions, we just dived in. It's like, okay, we're doing this now. When it comes to institutions, so for retail, I would say users, regulation to some extent made sense because they were not sure. Some other countries and users, they were like, we're just going in. We don't care, we'll sort it out later. Um, of course, companies and institutions, they have more limitations and those limitations are very different and you can even see it with etfs until ssc approved there were no etfs we had only them uh, etfs in canada so certain markets uh, um, advancements can be done only with a regulatory approval and we can't do anything else about it and of course now we see uh, bitcoin prices going up as well as the whole market and a lot of people speculate if it's because the institutional investors started to take interest in this particular asset class. When it comes to day-to-day -day operations and working with institutions, they they care about few, I would say, simple and difficult things. A, can they do it? Can they, is it within their mandate to do it? And then how to protect themselves also reputationally. And not a single institution want to hear from regulator, oh, you lost um, your retail clients. Thousands of them are complaining. They don't want that. Uh, because regulators, they won't be happy. Uh, and secondly, how to do it efficiently without building in themselves and spending too much time building it. It's not their core business. So, but in this sense, we welcome regulation because for us, when it's black and white, they know, okay, we can do this, we can't do that. So for us, it's easier, but it's um, retail and institutional, I would say they're very different. <laughs> okay. Um, regionally, like, do you guys work with institutions globally across the world, or do you work within certain jurisdictions, certain regional uh, locations? Um, we work, I would say, semi-globally. Uh, globally, we have those few areas where most of the innovation is happening and where institutions are allowed to do those things. So, of course, it will be locations like Caymans and Bahamas, even Bahamas after FTX, they have bad reputation, but it's the it's not the jurisdictional problem. It was the problem of that one actor. It's um, uh, then some of the Nordic and Scandinavian or new Nordic, including Baltic states. There is a lot of happening here, also in UK. So there are those areas in the world where it seems companies and institutions are more they're more open. They're more open to this new wave of regulation, and what we see while working with other stakeholders and regulators as well, they're actively participating and trying to shape how it will look like. So it's a, it's, it's very interesting time. You wouldn't you wouldn't think that even you know during the crypto conferences you would see representatives from the largest banks on stage. That would be unheard of a few few years ago. Exactly. Again, a lot has changed. Uh, it feels like, you know, two, three, four years in this industry is like decades. That's how fast things move. And that's how fast things change. Like I've never been a part of an industry that can innovate at such a rapid pace and get other industries and other players involved so quickly. I mean, you know, most of this market has only been around for 10 years. Bitcoin is barely older than that. Yeah. Um, and still the best performing asset of the last decade. And um, going strong now. I mean, it's it's just playing with its all time highs, and and no one's batting an eye. Like it, it's mind boggling to me. Like three years ago, people would be losing their shit, diamond hands and laser eyes, and now everyone's just like, we expected this. This is normal. <laughs> Nobody expected this. We hoped. We hoped very optimistically. We hoped. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the fact that the industry got ridden with so many scandals earlier on? A, it forced us to mature very quickly and also learn how to work with regulators. Because now it seems that we have a voice. As digital assets industry, I think we're being heard. Not always, but we're always part of the discussion. Yeah, so, you know, the crypto industry has been running a riot for the last 10 years or so, especially up until about 
the end of 2021. Uh, 2021 in general, I think, was probably the wildest it's been in its entire short history. And that's because there wasn't any real regulation out there, especially in the US, which arguably is probably the largest market for crypto in the world, aside from some in Asia and Europe and a few other places that are growing very rapidly, even here in Latin America. But the US has always been a really strong point for adoption of crypto and innovation. And that's even changed over the last couple of years. But um, leading up to 2021 and even then, I think what you saw was, again, a lot of companies and startups and projects kind of doing whatever they wanted and so much retail money pouring into the market um, that, you know, obviously it was another cycle and there was a bubble and it popped and retail liquidated. But at the end of that, by the time you got into 2022, you started to see real problems where, you know, certain players and projects within the space could not keep it together. Um, BlockFi, Three Arrows, yeah, there's another one. Um, and then, th I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems. And then FTX in the fall, it's like That's one thing it. after another, you saw tons of corruption. You saw people like Do Kwon on the run. <laughs> um, you saw Bankman Fried hiding in the Bahamas and his team running around the world. And um, there's money laundering and there's um, projects that are taking profits and shutting down. And like you could see that there was a real systemic issue happening within this industry. And I was saying it for a long time. Like I hate, you know, saying that we need more regulation, but in this space we do like, how can we actually have adoption and grow and, you know, have mass adoption of crypto and everyone using it. If there's no rules, if TradFi can't touch it, if institutions can't touch it. So it's almost like a blessing in disguise that certain institutions or, uh, or regulatory bodies and agencies like the SEC, for example, the CFTC, the attorney general attacking, especially the SEC, really attacking some of these exchanges, these wallet providers, these uh, tokens and these projects, forcing the issue into court even uh, to start figuring out what, what do we do with this space, right? What can we allow? What's acceptable? What's not? And I think over the last two years and how harsh it's been, it's really laid a stronger foundation. And you've taken, been able to separate all the bullshit in this space from the high quality gems that are actually going to bring real world use cases that are important to people and that solve problems, even for institutions. And, and that's why you got the blessing and endorsement of BlackRock and Vanguard and Wisdom Tree and Fidelity, you know, jumping onto the ETF bandwagon, trying to um, invest in the space or hold assets in some kind of way, looking and promoting the idea of tokenization and doing more things on chain, which is going to be, I think, the next step in this process of adoption. And it's starting to force this industry into the public eye through the institutions, which I didn't think was ever going to actually happen, but it did. And now we're at a different point here in 2024 where institutional adoption is a reality. It's happening and we have a long way to go still. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a bright, brave new world. I like to say like, who knows how it ends up and where this takes us, but like we're seeing the adoption we wanted to see. And now it's just a matter of how do we shape that together? You know, are we going to keep, you know, butting heads on these issues like CFI and DeFi do, for example, you know, or we're going to come together and support the industry and find ways to merge um, legacy systems so everyone can actually participate. It's a, it is a very fair point. You know what, what I'm thinking is going to happen and to an extent we already see it happening. We have an institutional adoption that's going this way and retail adoption going this way. And they're not really going to intersect anymore because now why would anyone who is investing in Bitcoin ETFs buy actual Bitcoin? I think so that cohort of users, they're never going to buy actual Bitcoin. So they're gone from adoption. But on the other hand, we do need for assets to be fully adopted. And even let's take very traditional fiat assets and money funds, money market funds that exist. It's um, not everyone is using it. A lot of people do, but all of the rest are just using money. And this is, it's going to be very interesting to see where we're going to end up in five years. 
how, what exactly institutions are going to fully embrace besides infrastructure and holding crypto assets for their clients. This is all understandable. We're already there. More and more of them are joining. But what else is going to happen? Are we going to see, as you said, more actual asset tokenization? Even though I'm not that optimistic, it will happen very quickly. If anyone actually try to buy tokenized assets that are not digital already, it's living hell. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, especially here in continental Europe, let's say you're buying a car or you're selling something, very often you'll need to go to the notary. So those records need to be on the blockchain. And not happening, not happening for the next 15 years. But if even until recently we had, and those companies were truly truly amazing at what were they doing when it comes to you can purchase the securities on blockchain but then it appeared they had to run a separate set of books to do accounting as the the law requires so mm -hmm. and this is again we need a regulation that will clearly define okay you can do this on the blockchain and everyone needs to do this 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 way but yeah yeah that it's the hard thing is getting that regulation getting some kind of legislation getting some rules set in place uh, because at least in the U.S., no one seems to really fully agree on it. You have one party that's all for it right now and one party that hates it like it's a plague. <laughs> so it, it it really is going to depend, I think, on you know the presidency that we come, have coming up in the U.S. In this year and what other countries continue to do to lend that influence um, and then you know how we push forward with it. I think it's going to happen regardless. It's just I'm worried – we're going to have legislation that's too harsh and that's going to potentially hurt projects and startups and institutions. And you're going to see a lot of people leaving and capital outflowing and being vested in other countries and other places, um, which is already happening and has happened over the last couple of years. Or we're going to have legislation that's beneficial, but it's just a matter of, you know, are players like Coinbase, for example, going to continue to, um, you know, be on Capitol Hill and advocate for proper laws and educate politicians. Like, are we going to have more players in the space do that? Are we going to be, you know, uh, pulling them aside and teaching them, you know, what this really is, what it can really be, that it is more secure, it is more transparent at the same time. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions in a demographic that's, you know, on average older than 60 <laughs> um, yeah. that can't fully grasp it yet. So, and the U.S. kind of leads, unfortunately. It always has led in technology, and it's at a point right now where it's not leading in the crypto space. It's actually falling behind in terms of how to regulate it and allow that kind of innovation. So there's a lot that needs to change still. So I, I'm not as optimistic that we'll get what we want in the next couple of years, but it will happen at some point. It's just a matter of is, is it good or bad. You know, I think one of the reasons why European Union was fairly quick, mind you, it took years and years for Mika to come into force. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's uh, to protect retail users. That's a very clear goal. But also, a lot of companies were setting up shop offshore, just registering companies in very exotic jurisdictions. And since traditionally VC environment is less active in Europe compared to the US, most companies were like, we're just going to go to, uh, to US. Mm -hmm set up company there with another one company somewhere where it's warm and sandy and to do our business from there. So when regulators, they see that they're losing taxpayers, active taxpayers with a, that can produce really high added value, then they're going to think it's like, okay, now we need to create a proper conditions for the industry to flourish. Actually on the topic of, you know, kind of teaching and educating a little bit, um, is that something that you guys do at Fidium as well for institutions to kind of like, teach them about digital assets, about the industry and where it's going to go and how to use it and the use cases that can be formed. Like, do you guys sit down with them or hold forums or, or do webinars or provide educational material? Like, what does that kind of look like for you guys engaging in on an educational level? Um, historically, I think here on the continent, a lot of crypto companies were very actively involved with the regulators. I'll give you an example. In Lithuania, where I'm from, we have a crypto tax loss from 2015. So it's, uh, and then we had a lot of ICOs that were happening according to guidelines, etc. So here we do have a good track record in communicating to the regulators. And then in turn, it, a, it's becoming more clear for us the limits and possibilities and then we can relate that to our respective institutions and 
and clients. First of all, um, a lot of people, and rightfully so, they're fascinated by the blockchain and, and the Bitcoin and those principles. That's really fantastic. Most of them, they won't be applying those amazing principles in their day-to-day -day operations. They care about a few things. If, if it improves their operational systems or decreases their efficiency. Hence, not everything can be on the DeFi and on the blockchain. And we saw it through the years that that institutional adoption didn't happen. Because Let's take crypto games, games on chain. Sure. Amazing ideas, execution players are used to much smoother experiences. So with them, and it same comes to financial instruments on the blockchain as well. Uh, you can see that some deals, uh, transatlantic deals are being executed on the blockchains. Um, and we saw that a multi-billion dollar deal costed $5 or something to execute, to send the money. This is what they understand and like. And then um, security. Of course, security is very important. And blockchain and cryptographic assets, they provide a lot of leeway to do things better. Uh, very often, we are facing some legacy issues. Because if the systems hasn't, haven't been updated, like truly updated since 80s, or 90s or early 2000s, it can be challenging. But we see a lot of what we call challenger institutions uh, that are digital first, that build that tech from the ground up in the last few years. Those are much more eager. And then even implementation and cultures are very different. You can just go straight in and start essentially building and providing them the services. Even though those more longstanding and conservative institutions, they are the biggest ones. And rightfully so. They've been operating, you know, some of them for hundreds of years. Um, and occasionally, we have our retail wing that we love. And with that, we have our mobile app and web app. And there, we're testing a lot of products that then we are reselling to institutions so they can give it to their clients. And this is truly amazing field where you can see all vulnerabilities how the login should work. Something this simple, but if you want to scale this adoption, it needs to be just as your bank, but more secure because crypto has unfortunately many scammers. And then you scale from there. So we bring them actual use cases. This is how you protect. This is how you educate your users in turn. Crypto and blockchain can be a great solution, not for every use case also. So uh, very often this education is learning by doing with them. If you come with that exact example, how it makes things better, they're in. Absolutely. That obviously they want to see the side of how does it make things better and you know what can it do for them and um, you know take them to another level. Uh, one more question before we wrap up uh, the episode: um, Can you talk about any partnerships that you have currently that maybe you're excited about that you think could really help start to push? even further mass adoption of crypto and the mission that you guys have at Fidium. Like, is there anything that you can share or that's public? Uh, 100%. Um, uh, end of last year, uh, we won the MasterCard Lighthouse uh, program. First company, first Web3 company ever to win that. And nice. you know what we realized, I think one hour after we were, after we got our amazing award, we realized it's an official acknowledgement from one of the largest tech companies in the world that they're in. And, and if you see um, MasterCard as well as other large financial institutions, how many patents they're filling in when it comes to blockchain? What are their initiatives? This is truly remarkable. The, um, all the markings that blockchain is not going anywhere are there we, we're going to have more and more crypto adoption and um, with mastercard they have some truly amazing initiatives and i highly recommend your viewers and listeners to check um, their multi-token network and that is a um, very curated ecosystem that is actually bridging tradfi and different crypto assets and blockchains and it's something closer to, I would say, hi-fi. It's not fully open to everyone, but you go step by step. Um, smaller circle, then you widen it, widen it, you test more solutions, and then you go full scale. And when it comes to mass adoption, when do we consider mass adoption being massive? Right now, we have millions of wallets, of Bitcoin unique wallets, and Ethereum. I think overall, almost 1 billion people on Earth have 
interacted with crypto assets. Um, so what, what would be crypto adoption for you? Because in my opinion, we're here. Um, it's a good question. I don't know if there's like a set benchmark that people would consider as mass adopted, but uh, we have a world with what, seven and a half billion people, more or less, something like that. Um, I'd consider mass adoption. Can we get to a billion? And not just people that have touched it, but people actively using it the same way people actively use social media or actively use the internet or actively use email. Um, I think we'll get to that to a degree. I think there'll be a billion people that actively use Bitcoin in some kind of form, either it's a, as an investment or as a payment. Like I think Bitcoin could get there one day. Um, and I think generally the industry will easily get there. Um, but I guess it just depends on how you want to benchmark it, right? Like people that have interacted or people that are currently and still interacting and in what way? Um, because there's a lot of people that have interacted with certain things, but they never stood the test of time or they never continued on or continue to evolve. So I guess that depends, but I'm just excited to see the continuation of the mass adoption because I think that has already started. It's just, you know how far do we go and how long of a process is it for us to get to a billion to get to two billion like how many people on earth can we get to actually participate in web3 i love your comparison of crypto adoption and comparing it to adoption of social media because in my mind that would be if we take instruments financial instruments like stocks bonds and investing um I don't think there is a billion people that is actually actively using those instruments to build wealth. But uh, there is a lot of to think about if we look at crypto also as a social tool that a lot of people use around the world globally um, that depend on those remit crypto remittances, then I think we're going to see the true mass adoption in your terms as used as widely as mobile phones globally. Yeah, I think in terms of remittance, that's how we get there very easily. And I think that can happen within certain chains. I still think Bitcoin could perform that role, you know, as on a layer two or through the Lightning Network or some other innovation. Um, I don't see why not. And then on top of it, when you look at it as an asset that people want to invest in, even if they never spend it on a cup of coffee, they just want to invest in it, buy and sell over a period of time. Um, it's in more demand than gold and more convenient. So if gold could be one of the most mainstay universal assets in the world and has a $10 trillion on average market cap glo globally, I don't see Bitcoin having a hard time getting to that point one of these days. I agree. Just, Bitcoin already flipped silver, market cap yeah. of silver. So we are, we are almost there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's on the right path. <laughs> um, again, it's it's um, in price discovery, trying to hit new new highs over the last couple of weeks already, and no one's batting an eye. Retail has not moved, not really. Um, so it's very interesting to see, again, how just three years ago, people were losing their minds when Bitcoin was forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and Bitcoin's hovering between sixty eight and seventy two dollars right now. And People are pretty quiet. Again, no diamond hands, no laser eyes. Like it's pretty tame for what I saw in 2021 and in 2018. Um, so I don't know. It just makes me excited. I, I like to see the gradual um, adoption of crypto and people freaking out less and taking it seriously as an asset and, and holding it and not panicking all the time. Um, you know, I think Bitcoin has a very bright future. I think that's very obvious. Um, I'm also excited for Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, especially yeah. Cardano. I, I think that I look at those a little bit differently. I look at them as operating systems, is comparable to iOS or Windows. Um, who around the world does not use one of those operating systems? So I think in theory, there's more potential for an Ethereum type of chain to actually be bigger at some point one day um depending on you know how many other chains can efficiently compete with it or maybe that's not even ethereum maybe that's solana cardano or something else but i'm very excited to see that aspect of the market because it's very untapped 
outside of Web3 still. 100%. And I think the first step for that to happen would be this, again, hybrid interactions. Mm -hmm. Because um, a lot of, let's say, there are a lot of banks and financial institutions, they, between them and their counterparties, they operate on the permission blockchain. And then those transactions can be settled on the public blockchain, let's say. So for, for those use cases, I think we'll see more and more happening on permissions and then moving to public blockchains. And then slowly, slowly with, for that to happen, we, we need not only amazing development knowledge and know-how, it needs to be also understanding of business processes and risks and how to manage those risks. And then slowly, slowly making some mistakes on the way, we're going to solve it. I agree with you. It's um, Those chains, they are de facto operating system for now only in Web3. And I'm curious to see what areas are going to be tapped in first. Perhaps financial services, that's, that's always the first, but maybe it will be more use cases, like actual widespread use cases. I think it, I'm I'm a big fan of gaming. I think it will gaming will be one of the biggest use cases in the world. So it's another industry that has quietly grown at a very rapid rate and is only getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, most esports tournaments are bigger than the Super Bowl or the World Cup. Like <laughs> mm -hmm. it's um it's crazy to think about, and we don't really pay that much attention to it. So I think it's an industry that can also really benefit from blockchain as a technology. You know, that's I think why Microsoft bought Activision and why there's so much interest in them hiring blockchain developers. And I think you're going to see a lot of these AAA game companies start to experiment with it for the first time. And I think that's going to open up a massive floodgate for people um, and could be one of the biggest areas of mainstream adoption within a specific niche. Um, that's like what I'm really waiting to see happen, you know, not just you know, the financial side, which is great. We've done so much work on the financial side, but what else can we use it for? Can we use it for notaries and documents, licenses, business contracts? Can we use it for arbitration in the legal field, in the health sector, like in government? Like there's so many use cases out there that are just untapped. Exactly. Um, and I'm, but, I, that's what I'm looking for. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, if financial industry likes not the tech stack, if it likes the principles and it sees its value, uh, the industry is getting enough attention and investment and love from retail users and all users, then, then we can scale it. So I think we should congratulate you know, each other and all participants that mm -hmm. financial industry is interested. It means that other industries will follow because a lot of hard things were already tested here. Anastasia, thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate it. I love what you guys are doing with Fidium and working with um, institutions, um, helping trying to bridge that gap. And I'm very excited what you help them do with this industry going into the near future. So definitely keep us up to date. Thank you so much for having me here. And as agreed, uh, hey, hey, for your 1,000th of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and lastly, where can people go to check out Fidium? Where do you want to direct them? Uh, Fidium.group. Okay. And then what if they want to interact with you on online, on socials? Do you have like a LinkedIn or a place that they can get in contact? Uh, I think LinkedIn will be the most convenient option. Sounds great. Um, yeah. Take care. We'll talk soon. Keep us up to date. And um, let's do another episode in the near future. Thank you. See ya.